Afghans were at the helm of their power during the closing years of the Delhi Sultanate. Ibrahim Lodi, an Afghan, was the last ruler of the Lodi dynasty. He was defeated in 1526 AD by Babur, a descendant of Chengiz Khan from his mother's side and a Chag Thai Turk from his father's at the first battle of Panipat. Thus, Babur established the Mughal rule in India. Babur ruled till 1530 AD and was succeeded by his son Humayun. It was during the reign of Humayun that an Afghan adventurer, Fariduddin Abul Muzaffar, popularly known as Sher Khan and later famous as Sher Shah, rose to power. Sher Shah was a capable military and civilian administrator. He introduced reforms in various areas. His reforms were continued by the Mughals and later some were even adopted by the British colonial administration in India. It is pertinent to say that the stage was prepared by Sher Shah for Humayun to take over once again for the second phase after the death of the former. And after Humayun's death, his son, the great Mughal Emperor Akbar, also built on the reforms of Sher Shah and extended them further. During the Turkish period, in the uh, actual Sultanate period, when the Turks ruled, uh, the nobility uh, were mostly Turks. Uh, they were actually Turks. In, from the time of Alauddin and Muhammad bin Tughlaq, we find some Hindus being raised to high positions. The Afghans had an, a different uh, mindset. They did not believe in despotism, in authoritarian rule. They believed uh, in a kind of a confederate government, confederate uh, rule, where uh, the nobles represented the clans from which they came. The Afghans were uh, sort of uh, divided into several clans and groups, like Luhani, Karani, uh, Shur will be uh, discussing about Sheikh Shah Shur, the famous Afghan Sultan, the Lodis and the Soyad. So there were different groups. If ever there uh, would be a Sultan, a leader, he would be a kind of uh, first amongst his equals. They did not believe in any kind of uh, despotic imperialism or despotic rule. Towards the end of the Delhi Sultanate, several small kingdoms rose to power. Among them, Jaunpur, Bengal, Kashmir and Gujarat were prominent in northern India. The Syed and the Lodi Sultans were of Afghan descent and considered themselves to be the first among equals. During their reign, the nobles played an important role in the administration. Sher Shah was the son of an Afghan Jagiddar of Sasaram in Bihar. In 1522 AD, he joined the service of Bahar Khan, the governor of Bihar at that time. He was given the title of Sher Khan by the governor for his courage and gallantry in killing a tiger single-handedly. Later, Bahar Khan appointed him as a deputy governor and also the tutor of his son, Jalal Khan. As Jalal Khan was a minor, Sher Shah became the virtual ruler of Bihar after Bahar Khan's death. In 1531 AD, he asserted his freedom from the Mughal ruler Humayun. He fought many battles with him initially capturing Gaur in Bengal and finally getting the throne of Delhi after the Battle of Kanauj in 1540 AD. Sher Khan's base of power was in Bihar, in Sasaram. Now, coming back, while coming back from Gujarat, Humayun heard about Sher Khan, that he had gone to Gaur or Bangala um, to conquer that land. Humayun immediately, instead of going to Delhi, he marched towards the east and took Chunar, a fort belonging to Sher Khan. Now, as I said, his uh, exuberant actions were usually followed by a period of lethargy. He stayed back in, in Benares and was enjoying a rest. And meanwhile, Sher Khan came back and instead of 
go, uh, going to Bihar or Sasaram, he took a detour route towards Delhi. And in the way, uh, as uh, he met Humayun and defeated Humayun repeatedly in two battles, one at Chausa and the final battle at Kanauj in 1540. That was the final battle. Humayun was defeated. He could not go back to Delhi because already Shesha was ahead of him. That was the mistake he committed. If we look at it from a broader perspective, it was a conflict between two groups. Uh, two groups of people, two groups of uh, dif races, two dif distinctive races, the Afghans and the Mughals. The Afghans at that time considered themselves as Hindustanis, as belonging to Hin Hindustan, whereas they looked at the Mughals as outsiders, foreigners. So the conflict was inevitable. It was a very broad uh, conflict between the imperialistic tendency represented trend that Babur set in, calling himself Patshaho, and uh, also uh, the Afghans, on the other hand, who believed in a confederate sort of uh, setup, configuration, uh, uh, rep as represented at that particular time by Sher Khan. It is interesting to note that Sher Khan, when he became the Sultan, he took the title of Sultan, mind you, did not call himself Patshaho. He resorted to centralization. Sher Shah was a military genius and an able administrator. He is often considered to be the true predecessor of Akbar by many historians. Akbar had continued many administrative reforms introduced by Sher Shah. Sher Shah uh, as he was a great military leader, so also he was an administrator. And um, he, um, mm, he is known for two mm, admi uh, particular administrative uh, systems that he introduced. One was he, the revenue system that he introduced. Uh, he, uh, this was started even before he had become the Sultan, uh, he, when he was ruling, uh, you know, acting as his father's representative in Sasaram, in a place called Sasaram in Bihar. His father, Hassan Mia, was actually a Jagirdar in the service of Ibrahim Lodi. Shesha uh, inherited that Jagir from his father. For some time, when Babur had come in 1527, he had entered the service of Babur. You see, he wanted to retain that Jagir, so he accepted Babur's overlordship. But when Babur died, he took advantage of Humayun's uh, erratic uh, nature. Hmm. And he was an ambitious man. So uh, already he had established a system of revenue there. And when he became the Sultan, he introduced a larger and elaborate system of administration. Uh, I'll give you a brief, uh, very briefly, the account of his administration. Uh, the entire northern region came under his rule after Humayun, Humayun's departure. He divided into several parts, provinces, which were known as Sarkars. The Sarkars were divided into Parganas. Um, and then the Parganas into Mahals and Mahals into villages, which were known as De Days or Dehi. So the village was the lowest unit of his empire. Uh, the head of the Sarkar, the provincial governor, was known as Sigdari Sigdaran. Hmm. He looked after the administration of the Sarkar, whereas the um, the Dewan, the person who looked after revenue and the economic matters, um, he was called uh, the Dewan. And uh, below him, in the Parganas, we have the Shikdar and the Amil. You know, it was categorized. There was a clear cut division between administration and the economic matters. It followed a kind of disciplinary pattern. You see, he wanted to retain his hold over the Parganas. You see, it was not possible for him from de uh, to keep watch over the extensive kingdom or the empire, uh, mm, uh, you know, the remotest corner. So he sort of made a division of power. 
the Sikdar or the Sikdaran, Sikdari Sikdaran, would be independent of the Dewan, while the Dewan would be independent of the Sikdari Sikdaran. Do you understand? They would be equal in power and both getting their appointment from the Sultan himself. None was uh, powerful than the other. Hmm. Uh, the, the motive was uh, to prevent one, uh, the motive was to prevent them from combining first, and secondly, making one more powerful than the other, because in such a case, the person who would be more powerful, supposing Shikdari Shikdaran is more powerful than the Dewan, then there would be a chance of him rebelling against the central authority. So ma'am, there was separation of powers. Separation of powers, which was followed by Akbar in the later days. And then he made a separate judicial division. The army, were, army was a separate unit uh, what altogether. He introduced the branding of horses. Then he's known to have introduced the dock, the postal system. Yeah. He would bring, uh, he built the famous, he's known for the famous Shesha Hisharak, you know, the long road stretching from Peshawar in the northwest to Sunar Gaon in Bengal, which the English renamed as Grand Tang Road. Not just the Grand Tang Roads, many other roads were uh, built by him. And the dark used to travel fast along those roads. They would stop at sarais or inns which were built by him and change of, change of horses were done at the inns. He looked to it that trade and commerce flourished. There were many Afghan leaders who to start with uh, were uh, rather reluctant to accept him as the supreme lord. Uh, he handled them with great uh, caution and uh, judicious uh, uh, diplomacy. Uh, he told them that if they uh, acknowledged him as the overlord, then, then he would allow them to carry on uh, their authorities in their respective spheres. And he had Hindu ministers uh, in his uh, army, in his uh, administration. I can name one, Brahmojit Gaur, was a Hindu who, was, uh, who served him uh, as a minister. <laughs> Sher Shah had a refined taste in art and architecture. It is evident from the Rotas fort completed by him in 1543 AD to crush the Gakars. Sher Shah had built a mosque in Patna to commemorate his reign. It is an example of the Afghan style of architecture. It is known as the Sher Shah Suri Masjid or Sher Shahi. The single domed Kila Ikuna Mosque was built by Sher Shah in 1541 AD within the Purana Killa in Delhi. It is an excellent example of a pre-Mughal design. The prayer hall inside has five elegant arched niches or mihrabs set in its western wall. Marble in shades of red, white and slate is used for the calligraphic inscriptions. The Sher Mandal also stands in the precincts of the Purana Killa or the old fort in Delhi. This double-storied octagonal tower of red sandstone was built by Sher Shah and used as a library by Humayun after he recaptured the fort. The tower is topped by an octagonal canopy supported by eight pillars and decorated with white marble. It conforms to the elements of the Indo-Islamic style of architecture, which was a blend of both Hindu and Islamic architecture. This was also the tragic spot where, on 24th January 1556 AD, Humayun slipped off the stairs, missed his footing, and stumbled to his death. In a particular type of architecture developed during the time of the Lodi's architectural style, which was continued by Shesha. Shesha's tomb is an uh, example a very good example of the type of architecture that was uh, um, started by the Lodis and continued. Sher Shah was the son of an Afghan Jagiddar of Sasaram in Bihar. Sher Shah declared himself the Sultan of Delhi in 1540 AD. 
after defeating Humayun in the Battle of Chausa in 1539 AD and the Battle of Kanauj in 1540 AD. Sher Shah was a capable military leader and civilian administrator. Many of his reforms were continued by the Mughals. Sher Shah had a refined taste in art and architecture. He is credited with the construction of the Rothas Fort, the Sher Shah Suri Masjid in Patna, the Kila Ikuna Mosque and the Sher Mandal in Delhi. The principal reforms for which Sher Shah is remembered are those connected with his revenue administration. Sher Shah carried out numerous civil works during his short reign and efficiently reorganized the tax collection department. It's the revenue system of Sher Shah that is most important. It is very interesting, you see, he followed that same pattern. Sarkar, Pargana, Mohal, uh, Mauja, and Dehi. Hmm. Um, Dehi, the village was at the lowest level, and he, there would be an officer called Patwari, the village headman. He was responsible for collecting revenue in the villages. Then Patwaris of different Dehis or villages would take the revenue uh, to uh, the next uh, unit called Mouza. Then they would be taken to the next level called Mohal. Hmm. At the Mohal level, you know those Afghan leaders I was talking about, whom uh, Shesha never tried to eliminate, because he knew that that would be futile and there would be uh, rebellions and revolts. So as I said, he pursued a very judicious policy of trying to take them in and including them into the administration. So he uh, empowered these uh, Afghan uh, leaders and also the Hindus who were uh, known by the names of Chaudhuris or Mukaddams or Khuts. He gave them a new name now, calling them Zamindars. The Khuds, Mukaddams, Chaudhuris, they belonged to the time of Alauddin Khalji. Now they were known together, all together, as uh, Zamindars. So at the Mohal level, he asked the Zamindars uh, to look after, he empowered them to collect the revenue. Whatever revenues were coming up from the Dehis th through the Mauza into the Mahal. So it was the duty and responsibility of the, uh, uh, of the zamindars to collect these uh, revenues from their mahals, store them, keep them in their kacharis. And ultimately, from the pargana and from the sarkar level, a um, salaried officer of the state appointed by the pargana officer or by the sarkar officer, or in certain cases by Shesha himself, called the Amil, who he would come down and supervise the collection of revenue and take it back to the central treasury in Delhi. So that was how the whole thing operated, his revenue system, and one would say quite, uh, quite um, smoothly. In fact, Shesha uh, was greatly influenced by Alauddin Khalji. Abbas Sherwani, the author of Tariqi Shesha, he, or, and Hassan Ali Khan, who wrote Tariqi Daulati Sheshahi, both have said that Shesha uh, was much influenced by Alauddin Khalji's revenue system. Uh, there could always be exploitation, and perhaps there were. I wouldn't say that uh, everything was just and smooth, but uh, he took all kinds of uh, you know, precautions to prevent uh, such things happening. He considered the peasant, the riot, as they were called in Persian, as the asset of the state. The riots, or peasants, were allowed to cultivate the land without the fear of eviction, provided they paid the revenue regularly to the royal treasury of Sher Shah. The patwari was to collect the revenue from the peasants. They were also given two revenue documents, of Kabuliat and Patta. Through a Farman, Shesha uh, declared that every peasant, wherever, every riot, would be given two documents. He had to, he had to have two documents. One is Kabuliyat, the other was Patta. The Kabuliyat is 
Kabul, you know, he had to give promises uh, that he would, uh, that he was promising, he was making the Kabul of paying such and such amount of revenue hmm, to the Patwari, to the officer. And Patta was a document indicating his right to cultivate in that particular land, you know, through generations. He would not be evicted. There was no question of eviction. And what more, Shesha insisted that these two documents, the Kabuliyat and Patta, should be drawn up in the local languages. In Bengali, if it were in Bengal, or in Hindi or Hindustani, if it were in Bihar or uh, up country in the United Provinces, in the upper Gangetic region. Now, the riot could not write, you know. The riot usually, of course, was uh, illiterate. So it was uh, on the part of the, uh, it was a uh, Patwari's duty to write down the document, Kabul, but he had to read it out to the peasant. And uh, I wouldn't say that there were discrepancies. The Patwari, probably they did cheat the riot, but at least uh, attempts were made uh, to preserve the riot, to see that he did not suffer, that he worked uh, happily. He was forwarded loans and money, advance money to buy seeds, seeds seed grains, uh, plows, and other necessary implements. So he tried to uh, sort of, uh, you know, look after the riots, the peasants. And, you know, this uh, official called Amil, he acted as a go-between. He was a salaried officer, so he would often come, go down to the village level to see if there was any discrepancy, if there were any uh, sort of exploitations on the part of the um, zamindars or on the part of the patwaris. And there were other officers like Shikda, uh, like the Amin, the Shikdas, and they measure kanun goes. They would measure the lands and put down, uh, assess the land, the crops, categorize the crops, uh, note down the harvest time, the, you know, the sowing time, and uh, the amount of revenue that each peasant had to pay uh, yearly. All this was noted down by the Kanun Goes and the Amins uh, and the, uh, you know, the Shikdas. Sher Shah is believed to have introduced the silver rupaya and the copper paisa in place of the tanka, which was usually made of an alloy of copper and bronze. He is also credited with the introduction of customs duty. Many of the administrative and revenue reforms introduced by Sher Shah continued even after him. These, um, you know, systems that he introduced uh, did not die with him. And we find that uh, Islam Shah continued them. Then Humayun came back. Of course, Humayun could rule only f uh, for a year. He died accidentally. But Humayun's son, Babu's grandson, Akbar, uh, he was an uh, all-time genius, a versatile man. And he w had, could, he had and he could take in what had happened in the past. And he, he had also a vision for the future. So he accepted the system. He sort of uh, reorganized it, put in his own innovations, his own changes, and continued. So uh, that's, that was uh, what Abbas Sherwani wrote. Uh, is it, it was continued. So Shesha's short reign was, uh, was a very, very significant reign. Uh, very, very significant uh, period. Uh, and it did have long-term repercussions, long-term effects. Sher Shah continued his administrative as well as military activities simultaneously. He besieged the strong fort of Kalinjar in Bundelkhand, where he died in an accidental explosion of gunpowder in 1545 AD. Although his reign of five years was short, still it had a long-lasting impact on the lives of the people. Shesha uh, uh, did not rule for long. He died in 15, 
1545, only five years. He died very accidentally fighting a battle in Kolinjur. He had taken Kolinjur, but a uh, cannonball accidentally hit him and he died uh, on the spot. He was succeeded by his son, Islam Shah, who more or less uh, followed the same line of uh, administration, um, the same line of management. He was more or less a capable person. But it was after Islam Shah's death, uh, we find that once again, the, Su the Sur faction, the Sur clan of the Afghans uh, being divided. And there was uh, Adil Shah Shur uh, in Punjab, Sikandar uh, Shah Shur in Bihar. So uh, the empire of Sheikh Shah had broken, disintegrated, and there were small patches of Shur uh, regions. And uh, Humayun taking this advantage, uh, uh, you know, he had been noting the situation for a long time. Uh, in 1553, he made a comeback. It would be rather pertinent to say that the groundwork was done by Shesha. Everything was prepared, set forth for Humayun to take over. And when Humayun died, it was taken over by his son, Akbar. Sher Shah was the son of an Afghan Jagiddar of Sasaram in Bihar. Sher Shah declared himself the Sultan of Delhi in 1540 AD after defeating Humayun in the Battle of Chausa in 1539 AD and the Battle of Kanauj in 1540 AD. Sher Shah was a capable military leader and civilian administrator. Many of his reforms were continued by the Mughals. Sher Shah had a refined taste in art and architecture. He is credited with the construction of the Rotas Fort, the Sher Shah Suri Masjid in Patna, the Kila Ikuna Mosque and the Sher Mandal in Delhi. Sher Shah is primarily remembered for his reforms in revenue administration he efficiently reorganized the tax collection department. Sher Shah is believed to have introduced the silver rupiah and the copper paisa. Sher Shah died in an accidental explosion of gunpowder in 1545 AD.